Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code FRAMERATE9. You probably thought this deer was alive. And this coyote was alive. And this pheasant was alive. Nope, they're not. They're dead. They've been taxidermized by Chuck Testa. Ojai Valley Taxidermy. I specialize in the most like-like dead animals anywhere. Period. Look at that antelope driving a car. No, it's just Chuck <laughs> Testa. Oh no, there's a bear in my bed. Nope, Chuck Testa. Hold on a second. There's a leopard feeding on an impala out on my deck. No. It's just Chuck Testa with another realistic mount. Shipped to me from anywhere. Call Chuck Testa for the most lifelike dead animals around, period. Another edition of Frame Rate. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Brian Brushwood. And this is the show where we take big scissors to those nasty cords and say, <laughs> screw you, cords. We're going to cut you. <laughs> We used to call it uh, Internet Gardening, but apparently there's an actual gardening show called Internet yeah, Garden. Right. So, so anyway. Back to frame rate. So we're back to frame rate. Uh, yeah. Uh, we are very happy to have along with us Ms. Eva Snyder. A, uh, well, Hello. I don't have a proper description of you other than Angel Mercury. <laughs> um, I'm a VFX artist. I work on movies. Oh, there you go. See? That's why she belongs here, because she can tell us, Tom, Brian, you don't know what you're talking about. I actually work on it. But, but for example, <laughs> those, uh, those taxidermized dead animals, were they real or CG? Were you able to tell? Uh, they were pretty uh, practical, but not a lie. <laughs> they were not special. You gotcha. could make more real-looking CG animals than he can make dead animals look real, I bet. Uh, with the help of a lot of other people, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a, it takes a village. <laughs> That's what they say in the VFX world. <laughs> it does. Yeah. All right, let's uh, start off with our big story. This just in, the big story. So, I don't know, last Thursday, I thought our big story would probably be the fact that Netflix came out and said, look, uh, we're going to take a hit on subscribers. This whole price change, price rise thing is not working out for us. We're going we're gonna to we're gonna not grow as fa fast as, as we have been. In fact, we're going to lose about a million overall subscribers. And then Sunday happened. Yeah, dude. Then they're just like, psych! We're not even Netflix anymore. We just spawned a copy of ourselves and picked a terrible, terrible name for it. They announced that uh, that uh, that they're gonna uh, Quickster. Really, Quickster misspelled Quickster. Yeah, K. I'm sorry, Q W I K S T E R. Not to be confused with the Twitter um, person named Quickster. Oh my gosh, that is the gift that keeps on giving. Whole this other is story uh, there. Yeah, we'll, we'll 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 get into that later on. But uh, obviously, for anyone who doesn't know what the heck we're talking about, how do you describe what happened here? Yeah, so Netflix. Reed Hastings, the CEO, came out with an apology, a blog post and an email saying, well, I messed up. First thing, right off the bat, I messed up. I was arrogant. Uh, I totally misread the situation when we came out with the price increase and we did not communicate well. So let me tell you what is up with this $16 combined price for DVDs and, and streaming. And everybody's at the edge of their seats going, okay, is he going to change it? Or, you know, what's going to happen here? He's like, we are splitting the company in two. There will be an entirely separate website and brand called Quickster for folks who want DVDs. And hey, by the way, we're going to throw in video games there too, so that's a bonus. Separately, Netflix will be streaming only from now on. So we will be able to strike better deals and get substantially more movies in our Netflix side. And people said, 
I hate you, Reed Hastings. <laughs> uh, yeah, they really did. Uh, now, he, this is a case, first of all, uh, something like this had to happen sooner or later. There's a reason that Netflix didn't call themselves DVD, DVDs by mail. They called themselves Netflix because from the beginning... Because you could over, order your DVDs on the internet. They had yes. no idea they were going to get it to streaming. Yeah, no, well, but but they knew... I, I don't know, though. I mean, I... Uh, all right, all right. I think they had, they've had their eye on this for a very, very long time. And, and obviously, the streaming has been a tremendous success. And they should, from a branding perspective, be exactly one thing. But the shock for this, the, the way everyone thought it was going to go, is that, you know, the DVDs by mail is, is just a separate division that would eventually wither away. And at some point, they'd be making so much money with the streaming that they would stop offering the DVD by mail service. And then they would be this one thing they wanted to be. But to just like a lightning strike announce this split, and again, Every time there's a new service or a new uh, consumer product, we have a tendency to freak out over the name. Quickster, I really do think, was a terrible name just because it brings to mind the failed social network Friendster or, um, you know, for any number of reasons, I think it's a bad idea. They, I think you could have done, uh, you know, uh, yeah, Flickster or something or I don't know. But the important thing is... Maybe I, it was a typo. <laughs> Maybe it was. <laughs> but the important thing was they needed to make this change. I'm just surprised they did it in such a uh, an abrupt way that left so many people head scratching. And especially when they're framing this as some kind of like to make it up to you thing. To, 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 to couch this as, sorry for raising your prices. How about we just stop offering that service altogether? Is that better? Like, I, I don't, I don't, that, that's the part I don't understand. It was a reasonable attempt to explain why they had changed the pricing structure. But I think he overplayed the I messed up apology angle of it. Uh, and yeah. I think that's what got people upset in part uh, was the idea of like you're apologizing to me by making things worse, which is the way people perceived it. They said now it's going to be more complicated. Granted, a lot of people probably only have one or another kind of account at this point anyway, right? But a lot of people that don't, saw this as a slap in the face. Like, we're now going to make you manage two queues. We're now going to make you manage two different brands. Remember, they're not splitting the company into two. They're creating a separate business. In fact, they're not even creating a separate business unit. The DVD side of the business was already a separate unit. They're just creating a brand and a separate interface for their customers. And what he was trying to do was say, this is why we were separating the, 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 the pricing is because we have this separation already and we needed to make that easier on the back end, but that didn't play. The other reason, and this is where I want to bring Eva in, is this allows them to make better deals for streaming. Because up till now, when everybody is considered a subscriber of Netflix, when they go to make a deal, the studios have been saying, well, we want you to pay a per subscriber rate. And Netflix said, yeah, but we got a lot of subscribers that maybe they have access to streaming, but they don't use it. We don't want to pay for them. So they separate out the accounts so that only people paying for streaming count as subscribers to streaming. Then they make a separate brand so they can go, look, that isn't even Netflix. That's Quickster. You're making a deal with Netflix for streaming, and so you only need to pay per user for the people paying for streaming. Is that, does that sound right, Eva? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's absolutely it. I mean licensing was getting more and more expensive for for uh, Netflix so you know they the only way they can combat you know the studios and all the companies who are demanding more money from them is to say well look no we don't actually have that many subscribers and in a sense they're like uh, minimizing their threat of and like how much they would eventually cost the studios so and it's this bizarre sort of situation too where in his letter he's basically saying like well DVDs aren't the future but we're making this company that you totally want to be a part of until we stop doing it. And meanwhile, then they can focus on making streaming better and hopefully fulfill that promise. You know, I, I, what about disc flicks? Could have had disc flicks. <laughs> well, that's what, like, when we first heard the name, we were all like, oh, it's, it's Quitster. So, because they're quitting on DVDs. They're just <laughs> piddling it out a little bit and waiting for it to happen. Yeah, it does make it easy to manage that DVD business and so-called wind it down when it's separate. As, as fewer and fewer people use DVDs, which, you, you know, there's lots of people out there still using DVDs, but that is the declining part of the business. I don't think anybody disputes that that's not a growth industry, right? That, that's at least at its peak, if not already on the decline. Uh, so so the, the growth industry is streaming. Everybody agrees with that. But then I saw somebody on, online write the idea that if Netflix had been a streaming company up until now, they would be looking to buy Quickster 
and integrate them uh, to, to create a broader offering, or maybe vice versa. So it seems jumping ahead of the game too far to totally separate it. Yeah, but I think... Oh, no, Sorry. Go ahead. If they're not, if they're, if their whole foresight is that the internet is the future, I mean, you're holding on to physical media is a, is a legacy thing at this point. I mean, Blu-ray won the the sort of next step battle, but even that's that adoption is super slow and minimal. Like most people just have it because they have a PS3 or vice versa. So it's sort of this. We're maintaining this this legacy product that eventually nobody's going to care about. It's that's what's happened to music. The music industry, like CD sales are minimal album sales. You don't, you don't go and buy an album anymore. You buy it off of, of Amazon or iTunes. And it's, this is the, I think Netflix is trying to have the foresight of, of building out a very specific uh, service. And now that's, and so now they're separating what got them started with what hopefully is the future for them. Now, why do you guys suppose there was such outrage uh, on the Internet? I mean, number one, it was, it was a shock and it was abrupt. But you, why you got is there outrage on the Internet? <laughs> well, okay, yes. Uh, and, uh, you know. No, no, but, uh, yeah, why did people well, – okay, they were angry about the price increase. Why did they get so much – I mean, there's so much vitriol. If you look at that blog post with all those comments, people are pissed. 24,000 comments to read Hastings' blog post. And, of course, right now it's a comedy goldmine. The Oatmeal had this fantastic thing. Yeah, which I, I saw that. I, I didn't think it was fair or even accurate, the way uh, the, the why Netflix is splitting itself in two, where he makes the assertion that now you have to buy your sandwich in two different pieces. You have to buy the bread at one store and the meat at some other store, which uh, I, I, I don't think that's accurate or fair, but it certainly is the way most of the Internet seems to be reacting to this. Why do you suppose, is it, is it the one-two punch of the price increase and then this bizarre move out of nowhere that just shocks everyone. Yeah, I think I think it's the uh, I think it's two two parts of it. One is you just raised my prices and I'm angry about that, and now you make it harder to manage. Combined with a, a, a miscalculation in the message where they they pitched it as an apology. Uh, like I said before, I think that was a terrible idea. When you start saying, "Look, I'm really sorry that you got mad." No one takes that as an apology. And that's kind of how this ended up being read. I don't know. I don't think that's the way they intended it. Uh, but it was sort of like, look, I know you guys got really mad about the way we screwed you, but here's why we screwed you. And that, I, I think that's, I, I, that's not how I, I feel as a Netflix customer, which I still am, but that is how a lot of people took this. Yeah, and I guess on top of, the, of all this, in the chat room, they're pointing out that uh, plus this happens right as they it's announced that they're losing stars as as a partner. Uh, I don't know. It's it's really if you asked me how I felt about Netflix two two three months ago, I'd be like they're rock solid. Nothing could take them down. They, there's no way that they could screw up the goodwill that they have. A lot can change in two months, man. I'm really surprised. Yeah, it's 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 kind of impressive how quickly uh, their subscriber growth has stalled. Uh, it may come back, but it has stalled. And the stock price has lost uh, – it's back to where it was a year ago. Um, wow. So, you wow. know, the, the, the stock market has, has taken a back step. I think what they have to do now is just put this behind them and say, okay, you know what? We did mess up. And saying we messed up doesn't help. So they have to come out with it, that substantial content addition that they, they promised. With exactly. another – Apology about how bad the last <laughs> went. They just need to keep apologizing repeatedly because that always works well. Yeah. So Eva, you agree? You think they uh, they need to uh, to add more content, right? Absolutely. They just need you know more content will sort of allay all people all the people's fears about DVD going away and and how oh well, if I don't have DVDs I don't get the same options. So as soon as I can start backing those backing this split up with these new licensing deals that hopefully this assists with, then, then I think people will start coming back or feel reassured. I mean, everyone's going to go try new options and do other things, and, or not everybody, but like the people who are really mad about it. And eventually, they'll determine whether Netflix is the best option for them. I think for most people right now, it's still the more affordable option. So as long as Netflix can bring back that content, you know, people will come back. Do you think they can? Do you think that Doing all of this is going to be worth it and will allow them the leverage to be able to strike these deals with the studios? Or are the studios still in that adversarial relationship where they actually want Netflix to pay through the nose for their stuff? Um, I think it might give them some time, but the studios really feel like they're trying 
uh, very hard to find a way to combat this. Like, I mean, you know, they essentially the TV studios came together and created Hulu to fight Netflix. So, like, you have this whole the the studios still are trying to figure out what the best way to handle the internet is, and they just I, I would say they still don't quite get it. But if they can fight Netflix every step of the way and make it more difficult for them, they will. And the alternatives will be Amazon possibly adding to their to their Prime catalog, maybe coming. Oh out my God! Tablet. Yeah, is there is now ever the time to to have the comeback kids in the online streaming biz? You know, step forward. First of all, what Netflix needs to do from this point forward, every single announcement they need to make for the next six months needs to be nothing about how much more online content they've they've acquired. It needs to be like so obvious, like. Like the, it needs to get to the point where anytime somebody working at a, a web web blog sees a new release from Netflix, they know in advance it's going to be another brag about all the new content they have. And this is a this is a minor problem that it's a small PR problem that's not going to screw them up long term. They're going to be able to weather this. But if I'm Amazon Prime, if I'm Hulu Plus, this is a fantastic time in order to start hammering down how simple and direct your service is, how it's so much it's like what you used to like about Netflix. All right, let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. You got an ax to grind? You got an issue you want to get out there? You got a message you want to give to the world? You can be on a Squarespace site by the time I finish this sentence, even if I hadn't added this extra phrase at the end. <laughs> Practically. You go to squarespace.com, you, you put in a, a username, you don't have to put in a, a credit card or anything, just try it out, you get a free trial period, you can import an old blog if you've got something and you want to you wanna bring it in there, and it's easy to pick a style and, and change some colors and have a professional, quality, great looking website from the get-go, right Brian? Yeah, dude, plus it updates instantly, instantly. Like you're playing with it and you drag this window, you want to make it a little bigger, you open it, then somebody who's there on the site just presses refresh and it's, it's done instantly. And plus, don't forget about their awesome apps for the Android uh, or the iOS devices while you're on the road or at the street or at an airport or at a bar. Like what I what I do is I use it for the anti-spam tools because you have somebody who tries to post a bunch of fake, you know, like you'll get comments that are helpful to your blog and then one like, free sneakers from Hong Kong. And then, uh, so all you have to do is go through those and it's super easy while you're remote. You just click it as spam and it, go, it goes yeah. right in and removes it. The them. new Android app actually works exactly the same as the iOS app. Uh, and it allows you to, uh, as Brian said, update your website at the bars and on the streets for anti-spam school. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Man, I think there's something, I think there's a show in there somehow. Some, Not somewhere. <laughs> Uh, anyway, don't, like I said, uh, you get a free trial when you sign up. You don't have to use a credit card to try it out. Just go to squarespace.com, start a site right now, or import your old site. Uh, and then if you do decide to keep the service, use the offer code FRAMERATE9, and you'll get 10% off for six months. That's FRAMERATE and the number nine. The number nine. Not, yeah. not angry no in German. Not, Although that would yeah. be kind of fun. Like, frame rate nine. We should actually make both those codes work. We should talk. <laughs> but they don't yet. So use frame they rate don't. with the so number nine. So make sure nine. to use the number nine. Like, that's, that's angry German lead speak is what that is. Frame rate number nine. Angry German lead speak is my Kraftwerk cover band. Let's move on to Film Fest. <laughs> Now, I want to start with my Star Wars Blu-ray experience from this weekend. Did either of you buy the Star Wars on Blu-ray? No? Look, okay. You, you no. draw a line in the sand. In the middle of the Tunisian desert, you draw a line in the sand, and you say, <laughs> this, the, no farther. Not <laughs> sent, Lucas. You draw a line in the sand, people. <laughs> hey, that's not the Tuscan rated, okay? <laughs> they have a proud heritage. Tuscan don't, Tatooinians. Don't call them don't call them sand people. I took a lot of flack on Twitter uh for, for people saying like you actually bought the you should not encourage him. I am a big fan. I don't like the changes that he's made in most parts, but I still wanna have that stuff. I wanna look at the special features and I had a blast. Uh it looks great. I they have remastered these very well. The movies look fantastic in Blu-ray. Uh, the special features are really cool. There's really they have the original appearance of Boba Fett in an animated cartoon special as from an the, Easter from holiday, egg. Yeah. yeah, from the Star Wars holiday special, right? No, no, it's an entire cartoon of its own. 
Wait, wait a minute. I was, I'm almost certain I thought that was a segment. Now, I'm, I'm it not, was not in the, in the uh, Life Day special, I don't think, no. Okay, I, I, man, I must be misremembered because I've seen the image that you're talking about, but in my mind, I thought it was a, and I'll tell you, who knows this, Adam 12 in the chat. He'll definitely say, aha, Adam 12 says he, I'm he right. He says he it knows. is from the holiday special. <laughs> yeah. I, but, uh, this, but it's about 15 minutes long, the thing that's yeah. on the Blu ray. So it's, 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 uh, it's, and Boba Fett has a voice. Don't forget. Oh, that. does he? Yeah. He actually, he actually talked. Well, I mean, he, he's got a voice in the, in the movie as well. They've got, well, he does later on, yeah. In the Empire, no, it's, he's, he's, he's no good to me dead, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in the cartoon, he talks a lot. Oh, he won't shut up? Yeah, exactly. He, he really <laughs> the won't. original title of the cartoon was Chatty Boba. <laughs> and he, and it just stops on Boba, shut the fet up. <laughs> uh... I also like uh, some of the outtakes. Some of them have existed previously, but uh, there is an, a rough cut of the cantina scene, which is in black and white because it's unprocessed, but you get to hear what's actually happening in the room. Uh, for instance, the cockney guy in the Greedo suit reading the Greedo lines as prompts that they're oh, going to cover oh. over later with the, with the actual Greedo speak. That's awesome. And so, and so meanwhile, like, uh, how bizarre... Like, I get so wrapped up in that scene. Like, I, I just picture it's Han Solo actually talking to Greedo. But the idea that the actor, Harrison Ford, is having to process this guy talking with a Cockney accent, that's, that's in, awesome. In English. He's saying the lines in English. Right, right. So that's why uh, Harrison Ford is able to just respond as if he understands exactly what's being said, because he does. Well, yes, that and the fact that it's... <laughs> also, he's sitting, at, he's sitting with a lady when Obi-Wan and Luke uh, show up at the table, and he tells her to shove off. Uh, well, that's not very polite. And that, they, got cut, that got cut from the movie. That's, that's right. George Lucas is like, he's not a misogynist. You also well, get the entire scene at Tashi Station with Biggs. Now, that one, that's one that I've, I've never seen, but I always, I always heard about. And I think, I think it was on some CD-ROM in the late 90s that, that you could watch. I only watched, like, a few scenes of it. Uh, but, uh, like, is this all stuff that you... You're glad it was cut, and you're like, well, I understand why this You know what? I, I understand why it was cut, because he wants to keep the pacing up at the beginning of the movie, and it's intercut at the beginning with the shot of Leia on the ship that's being attacked by the Imperial cruiser, right? And so it's a much more exciting beginning of the movie, the way he cut it. But right. watching it, I was like, I wish this had been in the movie, because now I understand why Luke was so excited to see Biggs later on on the Yavin Moon. Yes, yes. Well, and, and in fact, I remember there was a time, and it's hard for most people to even remember, but there was a time in the early 90s when you could say, remember Star Wars. And I went back and watched the original trilogy so many times, and I just wanted more little little bits of the universe. Like, I remember listening to the whole Star Wars radio drama over and over again, just for like those few scenes that weren't in the movie, but yeah. that were somehow part of the canon. And it was Mark Hamill talking about, like, he's listening to an Imperial recruitment tape because that's he wants to join the Academy to join the Empire just because he wants to fly. Which is like, yeah, you don't even really get that in the in the movies. Eva, do you have anything to add here? Somebody said he'll, <laughs> he'll follow you on Twitter if you get a word in edgewise with this. <laughs> um, well, I'm definitely looking forward to eventually checking out all the special features. And you know, there's always. Like Are you going to get the Blu-ray? So Are you going to rent it or um, something? Borrow. I it? think eventually. I'm sure we'll we'll buy we we buy lots of movies and see lots of movies. So um, I'm sure eventually we will have it. Um, my husband likes to sit and watch special features like nobody. So yeah, it, it was good. So, it's got good. It's definitely got good special features. I do want to listen to some of the commentaries that are on there as well. Um, but I, I have to say, as much as I, I understand the philosophical objections, uh, I, I still like having it and had a great time watching it this weekend. We're good. Let's uh, let's move on to James Cameron still pushing the film industry to project movies at sixty frames per second. What's this about, Eva? Um, well, it's just part of his, his uh, you know, stereo 3D push. Um, it's his belief and uh, I think many people's belief that stereo 3D will look better when it's crisper and played at faster frame rates. So his big push for Avatar was trying to get everybody to show stereo films and start shooting them. And now his next step is to push 48 or 60 frames per second. Um, so he's trying to get, you know, the theaters to adopt either software upgrades or projection upgrades for um, to be able to play the the, uh, the 60 frames a second, and then on the other end, it's trying to get you know directors and visual effects houses and all the studios behind the same format so that they can 
push this CRISPR look. Yeah, this, uh, this is actually, I'm really excited about this. This is something that Roger Ebert wrote an article about a couple of years ago saying that he hated the whole 3D craze because he felt like uh, 3D always felt uh, gimmicky and novel, whereas when he saw movies at 60 frames per second, they had a crispness and aliveness that, that, that really made them pop, and he was really big. He'd much rather see faster frame rates than see it in 3D. Now, uh, regardless of how we're getting there, you know, obviously we went 3D first, but I am strongly in favor of the push technology logically for this, although I'm really, really curious, uh, and, and I don't know enough about the science, and maybe you know enough, Eva, about this, but at some point, when you see too many, uh, a frame rate that's too fast, it brings almost too much reality to certain things. Like, um, there, there's a, I've, I've got a television from Samsung, HDTV, that does upsampling of, of, of 120 hertz, and I don't know exactly what that means, if that means it's actually interpolating the frames in between it, but I know this much. I put in Cool Hand Luke, and it made it look like a daytime soap opera, and I couldn't understand how. There was something about the, the reality of it, whereas before, this looked to be an old prison. Uh, now I just saw three actors sitting on a rickety set. And uh, yeah. does that make any sense? Is that is that no, just a that's, that's logical No, that's exactly what happens. Have? Is you get the higher frame rate. I mean, that's why video gamers like to play first-person shooters at higher frame rates because it feels smoother and more lifelike. Um, which is, I think, why they want to go that way for 3D. But it does. It starts creating this this hyper reality, and you lose that film look. You get the film look because it's at 24, and right. um, when it's on your TV, you get those those pull-down frames, which are a series of, of how it's sequenced to make up for that. Um, so by by um, introducing like more frames, yeah, it just ends up being smoother. You have less motion blur because your shutter is moving faster. Um, and it, it starts creating basically hyper real pictures where you start, like it's, it creates that soap opera crispness and you know how colors interpret in your eyes differently. So, well, good. I mean, that's the main thing I wanted to hear is that I'm not crazy. Like, I'm not the only person who noticed this because flip, on the flip side, a sporting events, you know, watching a football game, it looks phenomenal. It looks like you're looking through a window like you're you're right freaking there. But but for movies, right. it's I, I disabled it on everything. I couldn't I couldn't handle it. And especially for special effects, it became real easy to tell what were what were practical effects and what were CGI added once you started to see it at that resolution or at that at that frame rate. And when you do 60 frames per second in 3D, does that mean you get effectively 30 frames per eye? Does it work that way? Uh, no, that would end up. I would no, that would end up being 60 frames. You still get 60 each in each eye. eye. Okay. So you're you're not only doubling the amount of frames, but then doubling the amount of work <laughs> okay. for both eyes. So you end up with yeah, just a lot more. So is it tiring to watch at the, the, with that much? I don't. I don't think so. Um, I guess I think. Some people know. in the chat room are saying they, that they get tired watching two hours of 60 FPS. Huh. But I, I, don't, I don't know why that would be. Yeah. Uh, in other James Cameron news, uh, Avatar coming to Disney parks because, well, Harry Potter exists at the Universal Studio, so Disney needed something. Dude, it was uh, this. Uh, they needed something, is for sure. And Avatar is going to be a, a, a good franchise for them to have. Uh, but you nailed it, man. This is nothing but an answer to the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, which, if you haven't been there, Universal Orlando. Uh, number one, it's it's amazing and gorgeous, and the rides the rides good. But uh, but this thing is a money factory. They've got people lining up for hours to buy a souvenir wand because you get the whole wand buying experience. So essentially people are queuing up to spend money at the stores at this place, which is phenomenal. Are you going to be and able well, to ride stuff, Eva? Oh, I, I, I don't know. But um, it, it's definitely interesting in um, the aspect of the original plans for Animal Kingdom were actually to have um, animals of the past, animals of the present, and then fantastical, the animals that never were. Ah. So they never built that animals that never were part of the portion, uh, the park. So this is sort of their chance to start fulfilling that part of the, the Imagineer dream that they had um, while doing it through Avatar and hopefully getting, you know, all that. Will they have yeah. a greeter that says, I see you as you walk in? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I see you. It is I, see you. I see you. I see you. <laughs> All right, let's move on to Tube Tops.
The auction of online video site Hulu has been slowed up by recent developments, which could derail it completely. This according to the sources familiar with the process. There's always a new one. Uh, among the issues are conflicts over the digital rights, uh, a wide bid-ask gap. In other words, people don't want to pay as much as Hulu wants to get. And Yahoo, because of their own issues with the firing of Carol Bartz, has now been sidelined. So they're out of the bidding altogether. I kind of think Hulu is not going to get sold. Well, and, and uh, again, explain to me why it's important that they that they be sold. Well, I mean, I understand, I understand that the the media investors, you know, they they they're not getting what they want out of it, and they want to go a different direction than they want to go. So it's it's going to work better if they're totally independent and can go wherever they want. But um, I, I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm not. What's going to change for you and me if and when they get sold? I guess is my theoretically question. they would be able to strike better deals if they're not under the thumb of the actual studios. At least that's what CEO Jason Kalar thinks, and I think that's why he's pushing for this because they're hamstrung uh, by the studio owners who are very conservative, watching each other to make sure that none of the other owners get any advantage. And if they were independent, they would actually be able to play those owners off of each other more and advance uh, the business more. Does that sound right to you, Eva? It sounds about right. Like The studios, it's like I was saying before, don't really know how to handle themselves. Like They created or handled the situation. They created Hulu to try and keep up with where the Internet's taking um, you know, video entertainment and, um, and to combat combat Netflix. So there's a, a solid competitor. And they did pretty well and they pushed it and promoted it. But now they're at this point where the studios don't really know what they want to do and they're all sort of doing different things. I mean, you've got half the, the studios are, are launching their own website arms, their own iPod, iPad apps. And like the other half are doing, well, well, like Fox will do like the eight days later because they're still trying to fight the way the internet's moving forward. And so you have a whole bunch of people sort of going left and right. And then the the guys who are just sort of trying to run Hulu and are like, we want to do, we want to make Hulu better, and are stuck. Yeah, well, and so I, I guess at this point, I mean, they they are their own legally separate entity. They just they're just largely owned by the big media companies, right, Tom? Yeah, exactly. That's that's the deal. It's it's joint ownership amongst uh, a few different investors, venture capital, but pr principally uh, Comcast, which no longer has board members because of their purchase of NBC Universal, uh, and then Fox and Disney are have board members and are owners of Hulu. No, I, I, well, I mean, I guess, I guess it wouldn't. Uh, it's not even a case where there's just a couple of companies and they could sell off their piece of Hulu and uh, do it piecemeal. It's the kind of thing that has to go. Well, sure, they, 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 they could, but if if Hulu's going to sell itself to a Yahoo or to a Google, none of these guys want to be the first out. They want to get right. in on the deal. Also, right. I don't think ABC, I mean, ABC Disney is going to sell before NBC does, just in case. You know, the, it ends up being more valuable later. They're all going to bow out at once or not at all. Right. Uh, well, that'll be interesting to watch. I don't really have anything else to chime in on this. Uh, one. Chief executive of the RTL, which is Europe's uh, big TV uh, uh, aggregator, uh, Gerhard Zeller, said on Thursday that they have not done a deal with Hulu because the U.S. owners would not allow the company to sell its own advertising. We were talking to Derek Chen about this the other day. Uh, they, they want a piece of the action with advertising. That's the way it works with cable TV. Hulu wants to handle all of the advertising themselves and just pay out uh, fees to the people that sell them the, the video. Do, do you think we need, do, do you think Hulu needs to bow on this and bring uh, the, the content providers into the tent more? I'm, I'm not going to lie. I'm afraid to say anything for fear of all the emails we're going to get from folks in <laughs> Europe. I'm going to let the Europeans speak to this one for themselves. I mean, it's a uh, it's a two-way street, I suppose. Yeah, but we have the same issue in the United States. I mean, what Europe is saying is we're not going to play in that ball game at all. In the United States, because the studios own it, uh, they're playing in the ballpark. But a lot of advertisers are like, you know what? We don't, we don't want to play with that either because you're, Hulu is kind of artificially setting the rates. At least that's what Derek said. Right, right. I, I'm surprised that there hasn't been a more novel, uh, you know, system rather than, I mean, I guess it makes sense, the simplicity of just setting the rates, but I would almost expect some kind of, uh, with, some, with technology so advanced, you would think they could come up with a more novel way to sell their ads to where you could um, uh, charge, you know, flexible pricing based on the quality of connection between your message and the person uh, watching the show. And I understand that it's still an emerging market, but down the road, I would have to imagine that 
people would be willing to pay five, ten, a hundred times more for the right ad for the right target demographic at the right time. But uh, but but instead, we're seeing this one size fits all. Like, yeah, just give us this CPM for everything. And it's holding back the money that needs to be made on Hulu to encourage the television studios to put more content on Hulu and stop worrying about whether it eats into the ratings of the at least temporarily more lucrative lucrative over the air broadcast stuff. And and that is the real problem is that you've got you're trying to set up this whole brand new vessel to uh, to to buoy uh, you know the the creation of new material or the or at least the distribution of material and all the while it's so hard to pay attention to this small piece of the pie when you have this giant 800 pound behemoth that's worked for 50 years uh 60 years now and uh i don't know it's 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 i i don't know what the answer to is but it drives me nuts now on the other side we see the old-fashioned cable companies joining up with microsoft to provide live television through your Xbox 360, a blog called Digiday cites anonymous sources reporting Microsoft is near a deal with Comcast that would allow Xbox 360 owners to sign up for the cable provider's service and use the Xbox as their set-top box. So you'd get on-demand video from Microsoft as well as live TV through the Comcast service. Uh, Steve Ballmer actually said in a, in, during a conference during the Build uh, conference last week that they were nearing a deal with someone in the U.S., he wouldn't say who, that would allow them to provide live video. Uh, it's not like you can then just have the Xbox 360 over the Internet with Comcast, I don't think. I think you still have to get the Comcast service plug into the back of your Xbox, but I'm, I, I'm not sure about that. If this meant I don't have to add Comcast's plug into the back, I can just have any internet provider I want and get Comcast service over the internet, I'd be jumping up and down. I would think that was great, I, but I doubt that's the way it's going to work. Well, I mean, I, I, that would be amazing, and it might be something. I can see a scenario where down the road, like if I'm Comcast, and one thing I'm afraid of is at any point turning off the money faucet, right? So right now you got the money faucet going in with all your channels. You have to buy the entire package for everything. And so if I'm Comcast, and I understand, I see which way the wind's blowing, and I know eventually it's all going to be IP on demand or live streaming uh, content, then the Xbox seems like a really good compromise where it's like, okay, you can watch anything you want on demand through your Xbox, um, but you still have to have the, the cable package. And then over time, I could see this sort of, you know, pulling back, you know, uh, change, redefining what the standard cable packages mean and opening up more and more bandwidth for, for on demand stuff to where finally you get to the future where we are at that point where everybody can have anything they want any way they want it. And meanwhile, you were able to keep every single subscription the entire way through. I would imagine that's going to be their top priority. Eva, do you see an advantage to having your cable service delivered through a game console like that? Well, I was trying to figure out because I, I felt like this was a little vague in what exactly they're offering because it's, it's the way I saw it is like, well, either you have just internet and you don't have cable for a reason either. It's too expensive or um, you have Hulu and Netflix or however you like your cord cut, but you still have cable for internet. So then you have your Xbox to play everything. So then do you have to resubscribe to get cable service through your Xbox? Because then you wouldn't need the Xbox unless they were doing something where Microsoft was subsidizing the cost somehow and was trying to, like you were saying, replace set top boxes. So instead of getting a DVR, you're getting an Xbox. And in that sense, it's much more like it plays very well in line with Microsoft's usual um, like their sort of goals of having you know a computer in every room or a computer in every home. It's that same sort of well, how do we get that market of people? Um, so it's really it's a matter of what the offer is because if you already have cable, then you wouldn't need it on your Xbox. And so it, are they just trying? It seems like they're trying to take over and take over the set the the media center. Yeah, I think I think Comcast. Your, the advantage TV. for a Comcast is they don't have to deliver and install a bunch of set top boxes. You know, right? Uh, they don't have to maintain that fleet of set top boxes. And the advantage for you is you don't have to rent one from them. It, it lowers your cost as well, lowers everybody's cost. So I guess in that way, it's it's a win win. But uh, we got a few other pieces of equipment to uh, look over here before we're done with tube tops. Sony's SMP N two hundred is going out. Next month for ninety nine dollars. What, what, what is it with Sony and letters and numbers uh, for, for their? I mean, it's like why don't they take a, a clue from some of these other guys? Give it a give it a classy two syllable made up word. Well, it's name. actually called the Netbox. 
But then oh, they okay. also oh. give it this model number. Like, yeah, why don't they just call it the net box and leave it at yeah. that? I don't understand. That, that feels very generic name. Like, it's the net box. This is the, this is the S&P N200, not the N100. <laughs> it's an update. <laughs> uh, so, so now in this new netbox, you get 3D live streaming content and other unspecified new features. Um, <laughs> the only reason I bring it up is it's another box out there, and it's only 99 bucks. So it's, a, it's price competitive with the Roku as far as what you can get. Also, uh, PlayStation Vita, the little portable gaming console, has an app called Torn that will pull in live television streams served up from a PS3. Now, for this, this you have to have Play ooh. TV in Europe, uh, which we don't have. But what we're talking about coming to the Xbox, if it came to the PS3, then you could stream that stuff to your Vita. Over the, It's almost like a sling box. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm telling you, now uh, I, I think the sling box has, is, it's on the perfect legal ground. It's got the perfect uh, configuration where it's by opening up this private channel between you and your content, it, it's able to act as this bridge. And I think you're seeing other people, you know, we, we've seen people go too far with the, what was the DVD service that just got, uh, Zadiva. Oh, right, uh, yeah. You know, you, you, everyone's testing toeholds and all these different ways to get people what we want. But I think people are recognizing that Slingbox absolutely nailed it, and you're seeing, you're seeing more and more of these companies trying to emulate exactly what's worked for them. And finally, uh, Channel Android's latest reel showcases a polished leak of honeycomb for the Logitech review. And in fact, uh, Google dropped an SDK a while back, so we know this is coming eventually. Also, uh, they uh, seem to have leaked an app into the Android marketplace. Some TV apps seem to have leaked into the Android marketplace, uh, according to new TV. So a few more signs that the Google TV Logitech review might be getting honeycomb Sometime soon. We've been saying that for months, though. Right, but, but, but also keep in mind that the big news is not what's going to happen for the people who already have the device. Uh, to me, the big news is that uh, this is a doubling down of the, that they're serious about Google TV. And once, I mean, even as you watch them go through the preview of it, it's obvious how underpowered uh, the, the, I assume it's a Google uh, or a Logitech review that he's playing with. It's obvious how underpowered it is compared to where it should be. He even goes to start loading a game, and it takes so long, he's like, yeah, forget it, and goes on to another thing. Yeah, it's a so beta, so who knows? you got to see more horsepower, which is, again, why I've been saying that the way it's going to happen is from the game consoles, because you're, you're swimming in horsepower and running TV stuff would be nothing for what's, them. What's your feeling on Google TV, Eva? Um, I haven't had a lot of experience with it, because um, I honestly, I fall into the realm that Brian usually says, where, you know, you, you want your set-top and your TV separate. So, um, you and the rest of humanity, yes. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so uh, wait, I haven't really played with any, any smart TVs all that much. I think my TV has uh, an Ethernet port, but I have... Like I don't want to go and plug another thing in over yeah, yeah. You know, behind my TV. That's if there was a wireless card in it, I'd have no problem with it because I'd just be like, oh, I'll just connect to my wireless. So maybe that's what it's going to take. All right, let's uh, move on to what we're watching, which we still don't have a segment intro for. Kind of waiting. Now it's time for what we're watching. <laughs> it's Brian and Tom on Frame Rate. Oh, yeah. I take it back. On. We do have a segment intro for it. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, you you got caught up on Breaking Bad. Yeah, I didn't realize how far back I've been. I, as you know, I just spent this insane, grueling one month on the road, hip hopping all across America, hip hopping, skipping, jumping, he was all rapping over. all across America. I was, I was on my rap tour, is what it was, and uh, came B. back and got caught up on uh, three episodes of Breaking Bad back to back to back, and I forgot how much fun it is to watch a series just back to back to back that way. And uh, also and this loving. Sunday, yeah. This recent loving, episode? Uh, yes, yes. Loving the directions. Uh, first of all, this whole season has been about making unsympathetic, unsympathetic characters sympathetic and taking sympathetic characters and making them unsympathetic, yeah. which I think, uh, and also entering, again, preserving the same themes, but entering a new space. I think they've done a masterful job. It doesn't feel like, like it, it, I kind of looked up and I'm like, how did we get here? And I looked back over the last few seasons. I'm like, every step of this made sense the entire way. And that's the story that we're at now. So I'm still tremendously enjoying Breaking Bad. And now that I'm at home, I'm actually uh, back on the fringe binge uh, plowing through. Excellent. Uh, I, the season finale of Eureka 
was last night. Uh, I thought they had a great season. They brought in Will Wheaton and Felicia Day as part of the regular cast this year. Uh, and if you like Eureka, it was one of their best seasons. They only have one more season left after this. So I really enjoyed that. Tip of the hat to Eureka. Good job. Also still enjoying Haven. I just always want to give a plug for that because it's so underappreciated, I feel like. And I watched Ringer, the new uh, Sarah Michelle Geller show oh, on the CW. Right. Did, did you have high hopes for this? Or I, I, you know, I didn't, ha I didn't have it? any hopes for it. I, I, I was like, ah, you know, I'll check it out, see what Buffy's up to these days. Uh, and so I was making a lot of Buffy jokes in the early days, like, wow, Xander looks different. Oh, like, you know, that's <laughs> Giles has changed his outfit. But by about halfway through, I was like, okay, this is, this is decent. You know, a little choppy, but I think it's, I think it's good enough to definitely give a second chance to. Did, did you, any, either of you watch it? No, I did not. No, not yet. I want to, though. Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely worth uh, checking out. And then uh, we're starting to get our fall season kicking into gear this week. Uh, New Girl with Zoe Deschanel, uh, which has been available for free all over the Internet and not to good reviews, but it does actually premiere tonight, Tuesday. Uh, Person of Interest, which is the new J.J. Abrams with Michael Emerson from Lost, premieres on CBS on Thursday. Fringe is back, so you have until Friday to catch up. Uh, Brian, and then you oh, can start dude, watching I'll the new season of Fringe. I'll, I'll tell you what, now, now here's, here's my problem. Here's my problem, because as you know, I, I wanted to do this right, so I've been doing the first season, but, but the first season is all this Monster of the Week stuff, and, it, and it's like I, it's hard for me to, I'm seriously thinking about giving up on the rest of the first season and just jumping. You said to watch the last one of the first season and then keep going from there. Would, would that be all right? Yeah. Okay, I, still, I think I might. I, do. I still think that's yes. all right because you've watched the first month. You've watched many more of the first episodes than you need to. So yes, you okay, could, you could good. skip I mean, ahead. I think I, I've got a feel for the characters and I understand the dynamics. So whatever changes that are shocking down the road, I think I can appreciate. Uh, the Mad Men of Airspace Pan Am premieres on Sunday, uh, and then Terra Nova, which is uh, an interesting sci-fi on. Uh, I, I believe it's on Fox. Starts on Monday. Uh, Eva, anything you're watching? You want to throw out, call out? Um, well, I've been, I have to wait until everything pops up on Hulu because we're cord cutters, so we don't have anything. But um, I have been watching, uh, you know, the, the Star Trek TNG stuff, and we've been watching Buffy and catching up in Doctor Who. So a lot of stuff that I either saw when I was younger or, like, Buffy I'd completely missed somehow. So we're, we're sort of making our way through that until all the new shows start up for us. All right, let's move on to Interferon. Interferon? Why do I keep saying it that way? Interferon. <laughs> Like oh. Oh. What do you got for us this week, Brian Brushwood? Uh, you know what? First of all, this comes from an email. Uh, Cap K A P T Kipper. I assume that's Captain Cap Kipper. Kipper. But, uh, and we'll be we'll read his email later. But one of the things he just snuck in there was like, "Oh yeah, P.S. Did you know that Nicolas Cage is an immortal <laughs> vampire?" And I was like, "What?" <laughs> and then the le the leak he gave was to this item here, where it's a guy who has some stuff on eBay, tongue in cheek. He actually. Uh, writes this whole description about how Nicolas Cage is a never-aging uh, vampire, and the proof is this photograph that is for sale from the 19th wow. century of who is clearly <laughs> a non-aging <laughs> Nicolas Cage. I don't know why that tickled me so much. Um, also, this is, this is pretty weird. Uh, this popped up from an email, and I don't honestly know the full story of where it came from. The Guzmodo article talks about uh, uh, what this was all about, but these are puppets in ESPN Sports Center setup from the 1980s explaining in shocking detail uh, how the Nielsen system works. And actually, they do a fantastic job of explaining everything. We should listen to a little bit of this audio right here. I'm Chip Spaulding, alongside Clay Rogers here to cover the finer points of TV ratings. What do you say, Clay? Well, Chip, it turns out our viewers have been tweeting up a storm. Everybody wants to know how the rating system works. Since we here at Rating Center consider ourselves the ratings experts, we feel it our humble obligation to give the people what they want. First, to size our audience, we turn to Nielsen. To estimate TV audiences, Nielsen starts by creating a so sample. So wait, he said they're tweeting up a storm, which means this is current. This isn't an actual oh, yeah, no, old video. Yeah, no, this, is, this, is, this is meant to convey a current lesson in how Nielsen ratings works. But I guess to get your attention for the entire thing, it had to be puppets from the 1980s. And they were using the old yes. ESPN logo from the 80s on their coffee mugs. Yes, yes, exactly. Excellent and they attention to detail. Uh, weirdly, 
I mean, you've heard me complain about the Nielsen diary method and uh, the, the way they do their sampling, but they, they actually turned me around. I'm like, that's a very fair, accurate way to figure out what people are watching and when. And in fact, it even talks about how, did you know that every program has like uh, audio codes that are not audible, but that the, the Nielsen set-top boxes actually listen to? Yep. And know when you're watching what? Oh, yeah. It's like, what? That's yeah, crazy. They've been doing that for a few years now. Uh, yeah, did they I, get into VPVH and all that stuff? Yeah, no, definitely uh, definitely check that out. And um, I'm sure we'll have the links to that on the show notes. And you have started your own viral hit. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to. <laughs> We we were we were driving in a car this this hour long drive up to a show last week and uh, I noticed a curiosity about my Jeep and I just said hey hey record this and um, uh, four days later it's at two hundred thousand views it's on the front page of Break.com and a bunch of other Gizmodo covered it and a bunch of other stuff check this out this is this is my possibly racist definitely xenophobic rental car. Has like a voice activated menu, but I think it's like racist to French people because when you do a terrible impression of a French person, this is what happens. I think you selected Francais. Do you want to change language? Je crois que vous avez dit Francais. Voulez-vous changer de langue? No, no. So that's that's the whole thing, and uh, apparently, like uh, everyone was started calling out uh, Patrick Beja when it was on. <laughs> Plus, eventually, I had to chime in on that. But I was surprised at how few uh, French people were pissed off at me for that. No, because they all speak like that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> They're like, oh, I understood exactly what he was saying. Please change to French. Exactly. <laughs> how did you discover that? Uh, you know what? I actually I hit the button by accident, and it went boop. And it was like, you know, what do you want to do? And I was like, uh, and it says, I think that Francois. And I was like, hold on, wait a minute. And, uh, and we just recorded that. That is freaking fantastic. Uh, <laughs> and now it's time for feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. So this is a great thing sent in by James Gardner to frameratereshow at gmail.com. Uh, it's a pretty industry speaking, but he, he said recently at a cinema convention during a Q&A, uh, the hard word was asked about why film will end at the mentioned 2013 date. I guess during this conference, somebody said, yeah, there will be no more film copies of things by 2013. And do we have it queued yep. up, yep, uh, we do, Brian? We do. Okay, uh, so, so here's what he has to say. I think part of the ugly truth is it come down to economics. And that to keep a lab up and running and be able to actually create film prints, there's a significant investment to doing that. And um, without the volume, each individual print ends up bearing more of the cost of that facility and, and everything to just keep it up and running to make those prints. So as the volume goes down, those prints are going to become very, very expensive. And it will come down to an economic decision on, on the studio's behalf or the content creator. Um, so essentially what he's saying is... To, as more and more theaters convert to digital and the film studios c provide more digital copies and fewer film copies, the cost of making film goes up. Is that right, Eva? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's sort of a, you know, supply and demand. Like, the more the, you're getting a deal when you're doing a bulk run of, of film prints, um, the fewer number you want, the more expensive per print it, uh, it becomes. Film labs are incredibly expensive to, to maintain. Um, there's a lot of chemicals and very... Um, specifically skilled technicians who do the work um so that's it's it's very much a, a dying form I mean, most theaters nowadays that are being built are digital and even old ones are converting over so no more film copies by 2013 does that sound right no well it's oh sorry it's more of like a, a phasing I, I, out like oh sorry brian no i'm sorry go, go ahead even Oh, I was to say it's more of a, a phasing out, and like obviously there's still internationally a lot more film than digital, but even that's going to change because distribution becomes easier with digital digital copies. So it's it's not like it's going to just turn off, but I think it's sort of hitting. I think that's where a lot of um, the deals with the the labs are starting to turn over, and so more are either combining or closing. 
Yeah, I, I'm going to say, uh, and I, obviously I don't know, but I, it seems to me like film will no more go away completely than than uh, LPs went away. I mean, there's there's going to be a boutique place for them. There's going to be people who, for the you know, either for the international distribution, for uh, there, I'm sure there's a lot of places that don't upgrade to digital anytime soon. I think you're going to continue to see film prints, but. To be honest, like I watched one movie in film in the last year. It was The King's Speech, and I forgot how jittery and ugly and scratchy and spliced the whole experience was. To me, good riddance. So long, film. Wow. Die in a fire film, says Brian yeah, Rushwood. Get out, get out of here. <laughs> uh, all right. Finish us off with our last email, Brian. Okay, we'll do this one right here uh, from Jeff N. Hey, guys, big fan of the show. I've been watching the last few weeks, and every time you mention this supposed Apple television, what comes to mind for me is AirPlay. I do not understand why television manufacturers aren't building in AirPlay audio video support like I believe the TriCaster has. Mm. There are also AV receivers building in this capability. It wouldn't need to be a full software sweep. It's simply an input. Basically, this way, content can be streamed to the television directly for those who do not have an Apple TV, but also an iPhone, Touch, iPad. In the same vein, those who do not want to buy a new TV can buy the Apple TV box, especially with iOS 5, where the full interface can be married wirelessly over AirPlay. It would open a whole new world of integrated gaming TV experience. No box, but also no apps on the TV. Best of both worlds. Keep up the good work, Jeff. And yeah, uh, when I was there at the Twitch studios, it was amazing being able to just take the content that we created on the iPad using VidRhythm and just click AirPlay to send it straight to the TriCaster. That was phenomenal. I think maybe Jeff N. has hit on a future deal that Apple might be working on. I still don't think Apple's going to build a television, but maybe a, a line of TVs with AirPlay built in could be in our future. Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, uh, that's, that's tough because a line of, of TVs, you'd see a bunch of Apple logos on TVs if they yeah, did that. Exactly. And, and that, that's not what Apple likes to do, though. They like to tightly control the hardware. Yeah, I know. They are a hardware company. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a very good point. All right. Eva Snyder, thank you so much for taking the time to join us on Frame Rate. It's a pleasure to have you on. Yeah, no problem. It was a lot of fun. Uh, let folks know where they can find you on the internet and, and all that good stuff. Um, you can follow me um, at Angel Mercury. Um, and I'm always working on movies and stuff, so I tend to talk about that kind of thing in my feed. So who knows? Maybe you'll see something I worked on. Excellent. We'll keep an eye out. Also, good job on that uh, uh, portal <laughs> thing with Trachtenberg. Oh, it was awesome. It was a lot of fun. That was, that was really cool. Super good. <laughs> Framerate show at gmail.com is our email address. Thank you, Brian Brushwood. Goodbye, Tom. We'll see you Bye. next time. Bye. You better be damaged.